You've got to be saved through what Jesus did on the cross. You've got to, God has got to clothe you with a righteousness that you do not have in and of yourself. Now, Paul is here, of course, uh, addressing a Jewish person. He's got in his, in his, in his, in his got, he's got, he's having a conversation with somebody, and he's been addressing different groups as he goes along. And now he, it's as if he turns to a, a Jewish person, and he speaks directly to this Jewish person. He's, you may see how he says in verse 17, if you call yourself a Jew, it's to do with his very direct method of communication. And he speaks to this Jewish man about how, and, and he challenges him basically. He says to him, look, you think yourself to be a good person? You think that you're okay with God? You think that you're, you, that you're going to go to heaven because you know the Bible? You know God's law? You think you can tell everybody in the whole world about, about how much people should be made? But he says to this man, look, you, you, you think these things, but do you practice what you preach? You tell other people not to do wrong, but do you do right yourself? That's the important thing. Do you truly obey God from the heart? If you don't truly obey God from the heart, you're a sinner. How much do I know of God's laws, God's commandments? Here. We're showing. We can be 
very easy, it's so easy for us as Christians to slip into the sin, the temptation <coughs> to spiritual pride. Okay, so that's really by way of introduction. Let me just, just um, uh, then um, basically divide the passage up for you. There's two main sections that, that this passage divides into. The first section is in verses 17 through to 20, where Paul is talking about the foolish pride of the person who thinks he knows the truth, but actually doesn't live by that truth. The second section is similar but slightly different, which is this. The hypocrisy of such a person. So we're talking about pride and we're talking about hypocrisy. Okay? So let's look at these two sections. First of all, then, the foolish pride of the person who thinks he knows the truth but does not truly obey God. Let's look at read again verses 17 to 20. Now you, now you. If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know His will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, in the dark, and an instructor of the foolish. A teacher infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. And he goes on to finish the sentence in the next few verses. Now, I think we need to say here that the Apostle Paul is being, to some extent, a bit ironic, maybe even a bit sarcastic, as he, as he talks here to this Jewish person that he's addressing. Now, sarcasm is a very dangerous tool, and it is not something we should want to take lightly. Sarcasm can be very destructive, very cruel, very rude. But sometimes, a bit of sarcasm is needed to bring somebody who is a bit too high for his status, a bit puffed up, down to reality. It's like a, 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 it's a sharp needle which can pop a balloon very effectively and <laughs> immediately that person gets deflated. And here Paul is having to use a bit of sarcasm on these Jews. Uh, or this Jewish person that he is addressing. And you can sense almost slightly, almost almost mocking, almost a sense of gently ridiculing for, for the sorts of things that he is saying. First of all, you call yourself a Jew! Well, of course, he is a Jew. He is one of God's people, the person that he's addressing. But this person is, is thinking that because he has been, is a child physically of Abraham, that that makes him one of God's people. That makes him okay with God. And then the next thing he says, he says, You rely on the law. This is his great problem. He is thinking that because he knows the law of God, because he knows the commandments, that is going to get him down. Simply because he was instructed from a young age as the Ten Commandments and the other commandments of God, because he knows these things, because he has this Sent this superior understanding about morality, superior to the ordinary riffraff, superior to the Gentiles. 
house who he would, the Jew would have called dogs, who don't understand. He thinks, ah, oh, because I know the law of God. Therefore, I'm all right with it. You rely on the law. Next thing he says. In our translation, it says, you brag about your relationship to God. The literal translation of that would be, you boast in God. Well, you might think, hang on a minute, what's wrong with that? We should boast in God. Remember that passage you read from 1 Corinthians earlier in the service. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, he says, but well, you're boasting in God. Well, what's wrong with that? But you see, the thing is that they are boasting in God in a wrong way. Oh, I know God, you know. I'm not like you pagans. I'm not like you idolaters. I am I'm a real worshipper of God. It's not boasting in the salvation of God's commanded, but boasting in his, what he thinks is his own morality. Boasting in what he thinks is his, his religiosity. In what he thinks is obedience to God's law. So Paul, Paul says, look, you think of yourself as somebody who's, who's, who, who, who knows God. And then he goes on. If you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the Lord. You think you know God so well. You think you, you understand what should, what, the way people should behave so well. You think that you are able to distinguish between the right and the wrong. You can show people the superior way to live. And then he continues, he says, uh, you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish and of the infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of the knowledge of truth. You think you know it all. You think you have got to this correct, this, this high point of understanding of moral superiority, whereby you can teach the infants and the blind and the, and the people who don't know about God. You think you know so much. Now, of course, in one sense, these people who made these boasts about being so enlightened and knowing so much, they were right. Because the Bible does contain the highest moral code that is to be found anywhere in the world. They did have a superior knowledge. They did know the Jewish person that Paul was addressing here. He did have an understanding of the highest set of moral standards that there is. Because these are the laws which God himself spoke from the mountain. Those ten commandments, they come from the very mouth of God. And they were written in stone. And they are absolutely pure and absolutely right. And they never change. What is, what is true, what was true in those thousands of years ago when God spoke through Moses are true today. Those laws of God are pure and holy and right and good. So in one sense, yes, this Jewish person that Paul is addressing here, in one sense, he was right. He did have that superior knowledge and understanding. But the problem is that that superior knowledge that he had led him to pride, arrogance, and led him to think that he didn't need to seek God for salvation. He 
He thought, well, I don't need to be saved. Because I know the truth. I don't need to be saved because I live a good life. And so when Paul was speaking in chapter 1 about the, the sin of mankind and about the, the, the way that men have turned away from God, the Jewish person would have said, well, of course, that's right, absolutely right. All these terribly wicked people, they all deserve to be judged. But I'm not like that. Because I know the God. So they were half right. The Jew that the, the Paul is addressing is half right, but in a sense, in a much bigger sense, it's very, very wrong because he has got that understanding. But he's drawn the wrong influences from him. He's become proud and self righteous. And so, in fact, this Jewish person that Paul is addressing. Is, is really guilty of, in many ways, worse sins than the sins of Gentiles that they condemned. Sin of self righteousness and pride. Now, let's apply this to ourselves here. Many of us who are sitting here, many of you are sitting here, have been brought up in Christian homes. Many have heard the Bible from a very young age. Many can recite all the Ten Commandments. The great danger for you and the great danger for me is that we fall into acceptance of <coughs> pride and self-righteousness as the Jew that Paul is addressing here. I think, well, I know the Bible. I know right from wrong. I'm not like these people out who get themselves drunk every Saturday night. I don't do that. I'm not like these people who go out and sleep around. I'm not like that, you might say to yourselves. I, I live a, a righteous life. I live an upright life, a moral life. I work hard. I pay my taxes. If I, 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 many would say that they're married, got children, bring up children well. Or if a single liver celibate and, and, and self-controlled life, the great danger is he say, well, I don't need to be saved. Because I'm not, because I, I know God's laws, and I keep I, we I think we keep God's laws. And if so, we we are being just like the Jew that Paul describes here. Where, on the basis of that knowledge that we think we have, we become proud and self-righteous. But there's also here surely a challenge for us who are those of us who are Christians, those of us who have uh, been saved from our sins. It's only too easy for us, having been saved, to start to fall into uh, the temptation of self-righteous pride. We can look at other uh, people who are not yet Christians and say, "Ah, oh, how terrible it is the way that they live those lives." Or maybe even we look at other Christians and we say. What a shame that this other Christian does not understand what I understand. What a shame that this other Christian doesn't have the experience that I have. What a shame that this Christian doesn't obey God in the way that I obey God. And we can so easily forget that any knowledge that we have of God is entirely due to His grace. So we think about this morning, uh, in, in the first part of our service, where Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, or if you read from verse 30, it is because of him. 
him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And in chapter 4, and verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, he says this, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So here then is the foolish pride of the person who thinks that because he knows the truth, he's okay with God. And uh, we need to see from this that, that uh, if we're not yet Christians, we need to come to God for salvation. And for those who are, those who are Christians, we need to be so careful not to fall into the sin of self-righteousness. Let's go on then to the second thing he says. What he does then is he speaks to these people who think that they know so much about God. And he brings to them a series of questions. And let's look at these questions now in verses 21 through to 24. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who are bought idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So Paul here now asks, a series of questions to this Jewish person he's speaking to. But we do well to apply these questions to ourselves and think to ourselves, how do I stand up against these questions? First question, verse 21, you who teach others, do you teach yourself? Now it's a challenge to myself. Here I am I teaching you. And Sunday by Sunday I'm, I'm teaching other people. But the question is, do I do what I'm telling you to do? It's a challenge for me, isn't it? I speak about the sovereignty of God. Do I remember the sovereignty of God when I face trials and difficulties in my life? Speak about living a life of love. Do I live a life of love? It's a challenge for me, but it's a challenge for you as well. It's a challenge for each of us. Those of us who teach children in Sunday school, those of us who are parents, those who teach children uh, at, at, at schools and colleges. Do you teach others? Do you teach yourself? Do you do what you tell other people to do? Second question. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Do you exaggerate that insurance claim? Do you declare income that do, sorry, do you fail to declare income for taxation purposes that you should declare? Do you borrow things without permission? Third question, he says, you who commit adultery, verse 22, you who commit adultery, you who say that people should not, sorry, you who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? 
Jesus said that adultery is not just a matter of what you do with your body, but it's a matter of what you do with your eye. Jesus said that if a man looks for a woman with lust in his eye, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Then he says to them, you who are poor idols, you rob temples. It seems that some of the Jews that, that Paul was addressing, they would actually rob pagan temples and secretly have an idol in their house. Well, what about us? Do we secretly have idols? Maybe we make an idol of our home, or an idol of uh, our pleasures, of our uh, hobbies, of our celebrity, the celebrities that we like to follow, an idol of our status at work. And then he says, the first. Uh, 23, you who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? You say you know God's law, you say you're, you're, you are morally superior, but in fact is the reality that you are breaking that very law that you claim makes you so, so superior. Are you, in fact, for example, guilty of murder? Jesus said, if a man says, you fool, he's in danger of the fire of hell. Because he has effectively been guilty of murder. Are you guilty of slander? Are you allowing bitterness to lodge in your heart, or rudeness, or meanness? And so he says in verse 24, because of these things, because of the way in which this Jewish person he's addressing, who claims to know God's law, actually is not obeying God's law, he says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The reality is that there are people around us who are looking for reasons to speak ill of God. And if we who claim to know God, and who claim to know His law, if we do not actually live by that law ourselves, then this causes God's name to be blasphemed. People say, oh, look at that Christian, the way that he has behaved or she has behaved. Well then, what then should be the application of this passage to ourselves? Well, first of all, we need to ask ourselves whether we're Christians at all. You should not assume that just because you know a great deal about the Bible, that you are a Christian. Or just because you've been to church all your life, or because you know God's commandments, You should not assume that just that you're a Christian because you know the gospel even. Or even because you have prayed a certain prayer at a certain time. The question is, have you truly been born again? Have you truly been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ? Has your heart been changed? Simply knowing the Bible is not enough. You need to come to God and be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're in any doubt at all about this, I would urge you to come to Jesus and ask Jesus to save you. What about those of us?
this to our Christians? What does this say to us? Well, it's a challenge for us, isn't it, for all of us? Have you, have I started to slip into the sin of spiritual pride? Have we started to look down on non-Christians or indeed to look down on other Christians and to regard ourselves as superior to others? We need to repent. We need to throw ourselves afresh upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to realise that afresh, and remember afresh that our salvation is not through any works of our own, it's not through any knowledge of God's law, it's simply through what Jesus did on the cross. But this passage also should make those of us who are Christians glad in a strange sort of way. Because it should it shows us just how great God's grace is to us. We have been victims, haven't we, as Christians? We have been victims. We have not honoured God in our lives as we should have honoured God. We have, all of us, been guilty at different times of spiritual pride, hypocrisy, inconsistency. And yet, the blood of Jesus has paid for our sins. And so, in a strange sort of way, this passage, searching though it is, should actually make us, make those of us who are Christians, think what an amazing thing it is. God has loved me. Christ has paid for my sins, even my sin of hypocrisy, even my sin of spiritual pride. That's been paid for by the blood. Of Jesus Christ. And so, in a strange way, although it's a challenging passage, it should actually lead us to be grateful to God all the more, those of us who are Christians, for what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we?